All right, well, good evening, everyone. My name is Frater Anselm Jacob Smith. I am a scholastic with the Priest of the Sacred Heart, and Father David very kindly asked me to give you this presentation. This, uh, oh, it was about a month ago now. We were, we were in the sacristy vesting for Mass, and he just passed the notion to me, like, hey, you want to give a cocktails and Catholicism talk? And I was like, sure, whatever. I, I, I was like, what do you want me to talk about? He's like, your vocation story. I was like, cool, I did that for the Sarens back in Houston four years ago. I can, I can recycle that PowerPoint, and, you know? Uh, so uh, <laughs> that's how this happened. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to be up here and, and with you all. So uh, I, I love sharing this story. Uh, I, I always find it interesting when people ask me for it. You know, I, I, like, I don't think I'm a very spectacularly interesting person, but I know people always want to hear about how priests came to find their vocation. I might not be one yet, but um, as I'm working towards it, people, people seem to be interested in what draws people to that life. And, I know when I was on Marquette campus and when I was studying for my bachelor's degree, a pretty common comment I would get from students who either were not Catholic or were maybe Catholic but didn't go to mass very often. Down. Slow down? <laughs> I think you'll find that that's hard for me to do. <laughs> I, but I'll try my best. Um, but but <laughs> when, when I was on Marquette campus and I was interacting with students who were either of a different faith tradition or happened to be lapsed Catholics, pretty often I would get the question of like, that means you can't get married, right? Why would you ever want to do that? Or that means you have to like, like what does it mean to be poor? Why would you want to take a vow of poverty? People were always perplexed by the idea that I would not only want to enter into these things, but then find them as a consequence of them liberated by them. So I, I always find the vocation story to be an interesting way to kind of bridge the gap between what would seem to be an almost insurmountable lifestyle with the joy of living a life dedicated to God. So I, I, I gave this talk this title. I, I was uh, I was, I know when sister asked me what I wanted to call it, I, I was like, I called this heart to heart back in 2021, I think, when I gave this talk the first time, and I decided to go ahead and recycle the, the title, um, both because I think it speaks to our charism and, again, that notion of communicating across boundaries of like how it, how it is to live a religious life, you know, one heart speaks to another, and I think that's how we foster dialogue. So. This is Heart Speaks to Heart, How a Lutheran Became a Catholic Religious. So I, um, as always, I think it's good that we start with prayer. Um, I took this one from one of our vocation materials. So um, if you all join me in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. For gracious God, you have blessed us with many gifts and talents. Grant us the wisdom to know how best to use them for the glory of your name. Jesus calls, come, follow me. We wish to follow him and be faithful to his call. Help us to see in ourselves what you see, and give us the courage to follow wherever you might lead. Bless the church with generous hearts, eager to serve your people, and spread your word. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So in early childhood, I actually was not a Lutheran. Uh, I know the talk says that it was a Lutheran to Catholic conversion. There's actually a lot of miniature shifts in religious um, appetite that happen in the, in the midst of it. I was baptized actually a traditional Presbyterian, um, and this is the church that I was baptized at. It is now lo it's no longer in existence, but this is Kirk of the Hills Presbyterian, where I was baptized as an infant. This is in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, although I, wasn't, I was born in Tulsa, my parents lived in a, a town outside Dallas called McKinney. And, uh, but th this is the church where my parents both tell me that they first really came to faith in Christ. So this church is very important to them, and so they came up to Tulsa to have me baptized here. And then when we moved there a couple years later, this is the church that they regularly attended. I went to Children's Church here for a couple years before we ended up leaving Tulsa when I was five. But my initial religious experience in the Protestant tradition was through uh, the Calvinist Presbyterian Church. Um, later on, my parents would leave this denomination for a variety of reasons. Um, probably the most prominent one being the admission of um, pastors and same-sex unions, um, which caused a big divide in the Presbyterian communion, and a lot of people, including my parents, ended up leaving over that. But this is where, I, where my faith journey began, in, in some sense, I, because as for all of us, our, our faith journey begins with our baptism, and for many of us, that was as in infancy like it was for me. So, um, and as the Catholic Church states, all baptisms done under Trinitarian formula are valid. So this was my baptism and my entrance into communion with Christ. Now, 
off and on after Presbyterianism, when we first moved to Texas, I was in and out of a lot of different churches. My parents could never really find one that they wanted to make a home church. So we would go in and out of Baptist churches, of uh, non-denominational Protestant churches, uh, and some traditional Lutheran churches before we found this place. This is um, Salem Lutheran Church in Tomball, Texas. This is a very big, um, incredibly massive for its size, um, Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, which exists in, like I said, Tomball. I was sent here to school for two years, third and fourth grade, where they have a private Lutheran schooling system, which is quite highly accredited by the, the local school district. So my parents sent me there because my mother really believed in having some sort of Christian education, although she was opposed to the Roman Catholic Church for a variety of reasons. So uh, anyway, she would not send us to Catholic school, but she wanted to send us to an independent Protestant one. So this is where I ended up for two years, third and fourth grade. And while I was here, I fostered a friendship with um, another friend who I, I, I haven't talked to him in a while, although we're still connected. His name is Andrew Mahoney, and his parents and my parents um, became close. And so after I finished at Salem, fourth grade, my parents weren't making enough money to continue to send me to private school. So they pulled me, my brother and sister out, and we were ending up in a, we ended up in a homeschool program. We would do stuff online and stay at home with my mom. But then after that, my brother and sister got moved to public school. They asked me if I wanted to go, and I said no, so I continued being homeschooled. But in the midst of all this, my parents had stopped going to church, and us included. So we had not been to church. We'd stopped going to church for about four or five years at this point. And when I finally got to seventh grade, uh, the Mahoney's asked my parents what they were giving us for religious instruction. And my parents were like, well, we're really not doing anything with our kids right now. Um, we only go to church Christmas and Easter. And that was about it. Oftentimes, sometimes we didn't even go for Easter, but usually we always go, would, would go for Christmas. My mother really liked to do the candlelight services at Protestant churches. Sort of like what we have in the Easter vigil is what Protestant churches will do for Christmas. Everyone processes in with a candle and sits at the pew, and um, it's something my mother really enjoys. So we would go for Christmas, but not for Easter. But in seventh grade, that changed, and my, my mother asked, or um, these, these friends of my parents asked, what are you doing? And, they were like, well, Salem has a confirmation program where your son can learn about the Bible and scripture and learn about why we want to be followers of Jesus. And so my mom was sold. She was like, okay, sure, I'll send Jacob to, to confirmation. Now, interestingly enough, she didn't do that with the other two siblings. So um, for two years, uh, it was just me and my mom going to church. My father and my brother and sister never went. So we had a very fractured family dynamic on church. I remember I was pretty resentful. Um, about this because I was like, Mom, why do Dad and Morgan and Joey get to sit in bed all day and, you know, enjoy their Sunday and I get dragged to the confirmation meetings that last for four hours. You know, I have to go to the service and then I have to go to confirmation and then we have a small group. And then not only that, but then it included all these other extra commitments because like we had um, retreats that I had to go on. There was one that happened on my birthday one year that I was very upset. I had to, I was like, this is my birthday and you're making me go to a four day retreat. And my mom's like, well, you have to do it. And I was like, I don't, I was, I was so upset. But I think that's natural for any kid that's like, I mean, I was a, eighth grader, you know, I think eighth grade is when you start to get a little bit antsy about religion in general or, you know, things your parents make you do. It's like, ah, uh, you know, so I was, I was grumbling about that, but I went and I did it. And so this is my first confirmation. Uh, the photo on the right is my family and me, my little brother, Joseph, my, my sister, Morgan, I'm the eldest. And then my parents, my uh, Mandy, my mom and Jack, my dad. And then on the left is the full photo of my entire confirmation class. Um, you can see, you really can't tell who the pastors are because it, my Lutheran church was very non-traditional. All the pastors wore suits and ties, which in the Missouri Synod tradition is quite unusual. Usually they wear vestments like the Catholic church does. But I went to a very low church, Missouri Synod parish, where they have like Hillsong music and I call it Boyfriend Jesus. You know, it's like, it's like pop music, but with Jesus's name in it. And... Um, you know, and everyone dances, and there's a rock band, and flashing lights, and, you know, and then the pastor gets up for an hour and a half and talks to you. Um, so we, we even had, um, sometimes they would even invite women up to preach, which was rare, but it would happen. But for, for Missouri Synod Church, this is very uncharacteristic, which interesting when I first came up to Milwaukee, and people were like, oh, you were a Lutheran. That's so close to Catholic, right? And I was like, not the one I went to, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, up here maybe, but not the one I went to. Um, but they were very conservative in their theology. So, I mean, in terms of that, I guess we were closer. Although, 
I wouldn't even say that because the theology is very similar. I, I like to say that everything in the Bible Belt gets homogenized in the Protestant tradition. Everything kind of becomes an effigy of the Southern Baptist tradition. So like, even though the church officially taught that communion was kind of the body and blood of Jesus, most people were like, oh, it's just a symbol. You know, and, and I don't think the pastors gave two hoots if you thought that or not. So, <laughs> but you, that's why you can tell uh, Pastor Kirk is the one up there uh, at the very top corner next to that woman in the white dress. Um, he is still the pastor there, and he's kind of turned it into his own personal Lutheran megachurch. If you drive past it now on the, the road that goes past the church, there's a big billboard with his face on it inviting you to come to church. So, <laughs> But like all good things, uh, there, it came to an end. Uh, I was probably a confessional Lutheran for no more than three months before I started to really decide that I didn't want to do it anymore. And part of that had to do with the continuing strain, I think, from being the only person in my family that was being mandated to go to church by my parents, and then the fact that my father wasn't setting an example and coming at all. So um, I think that there was some strain there. But uh, as I began to uncover Lutheranism myself, my confirmation program didn't teach a lot of actual Lutheran tradition. It was more about the scripture and what we interpreted the scripture as. But when I decided that um, I was going to get into and study Lutheran theology, um, I actually did not like what I read. Uh, I, I did not think Martin Luther was a very palatable individual. I read about a lot of things that he said and did that I thought were quite extreme. And I remember when I first learned that the way that we practice, uh, this will this will come into another slide later, but um, the history behind the Reformation really affected me. So um, for a variety of reasons, um, probably the most significant of which though was the moral tradition of the parish that I went to. I was very upset that I felt like things were incongruent. Like it was totally okay for parishioners at our church to get divorced and remarried as much as they wanted to. But like same sex unions were wrong and I was like, why is one okay and the other's not? That doesn't make sense. Why are we cherry picking what, what we say scripture says? You know, and Lutherans are very much biblical literalists in a lot of ways. So it felt strange that we would have so incongruent a moral theology. Um, and for that, and for a lot of other reasons, I asked my parents to stop going to church. And I think at this point, I had done the confirmation. My mom finally relented, and I stopped going to church. So um, I was tempted by atheism for a time. But uh, I made Pascal's Wager, which if you guys don't know, this is my section to get all geeky about philosophy for a little bit. This is, I, I, studied, it in, I studied it in college, so I, I, I love to talk about it. But Blaise Pascal was a French mathematician and polymath, and he also worked in philosophy of religion. He himself uh, was a non-believer for a long time and then came to faith later on in life and wrote this big book called Les Pensées, which literally means the thoughts. It was a diary that was posted after his death considering... Um, all of his thoughts on faith and religion. And inside this book, he makes this argument called The Wager, where he argues that um, the, either, there's two possibilities. Either God can exist or he doesn't exist. And realistically speaking, he's talking about the Christian God. God either exists or he doesn't, and you can either believe in God or you don't. And if you, believe in God, or, uh, if you don't believe in God and God exists, well, that sucks for you. You go to hell and that's really bad, you know? Um, and if you don't believe in God and God doesn't exist, um, then, hey, you gain some, you get, to, you get to live a life of pleasure, you know, there's no punishment for it. You know, you get to drink as much as you want, do drugs, whatever, you know? Um, and there's no, there's no punishment for that. So you gain, uh, you gain finite gain is what they say. Um, but if you, if you believe in God and God exists, then wow, you get infinite gain because you get the eternal pleasure of the beatific vision. You, know, you get to live with God forever in heaven. But if you believe in God and God doesn't exist, you only have finite loss. You made temporal sacrifice, which in the grand scheme of things isn't much, and you're not going to have any more life afterwards, so there's nothing to really be upset about. Um, and this argument essentially is done to say, well, it's better to believe in God because all you risk is temporal loss, which doesn't really matter, um, and you have opportunity for in unlimited gain, which is heaven. Whereas if you don't believe in God, yeah, you might gain some pleasure on earth, but you'll be condemned to eternal hellfire if God is real. And, which the choice there, Pascal says, is pretty easy to make, right? You know, like, well, it's obviously if you're a betting man, you'd want to bet on God existing, which is why it's called the wager. You wager that God exists, and so you choose to believe. Um, so as a 14-year-old boy, I made the wager, not knowing that this was a thing in philosophy until later on, but um, I, I, this, is, this is why I never became an atheist. I, when the, the closest 
if I ever got, I made the wager. I was like, it seems dumb to want to, you know, to risk going to hell when God could exist, and that would kind of suck. I don't want to do that. So um, I made the wager, and I did not become an atheist. However, alongside this time when I was 14 years old, I became a massive history nerd. And I got really into studying the history, um, particularly of China and Japan. And I really got into um, how, did Catholic, or how did Christianity spread was a question I asked myself um, while I was doing this. Um, and uh, that led me back to Europe because Christianity came out of Europe during the colonial age and during the Renaissance. And then that led me back into early church history. And when I finally started to study the early church, I was like, wait, people were not worshiping like we were worshiping at that Lutheran church that I grew up in. People weren't worshiping like that Presbyterian church where I was baptized. They looked kind of like the Catholic church when they were worshiping. Um, and then you go even deeper, you see the claims. of. And th I mean, the things kind of like began to fall into place, right? I mean, apostolic succession, the idea that, you know, you have six literal successors to the apostles who confer Christ's grace, that you can trace all the way back to Jesus himself. Um, the idea that um, it's important to have special places of worship, um, the use of icons, which is very well historically documented in the church, um, things like religious symbols. Um, this, I mean, so here I have three individual pictures. This first one is um, a picture of uh, Rene, um, a medieval church where you have a mass going on in the background. You have the religious women here that are praying before uh, the crucifix. Um, you have a confessional there. You have um, sepulcher knights in the background. Um, here you have a Templar, and then in the bottom right, um, which will come into play later, are the Christians of Japan, who um, I was particularly inspired by the, the stories of martyrdom um, in, in East Asia. And all these things led me to want to consider Catholicism more seriously. Um, so I actually made the step to reach out to my local parish, uh, which was St. Ignatius Loyola Catholic Community in Spring, Texas. I sent an email to the parish office and I said, hi, I'm Jacob Smith, I'm 15. I'm kind of curious about the Catholic Church. Can I talk to your priest? And the secretary got back to me within two days, I think, saying like, sure, you can meet with him this day, this time, come five minutes early. Okay, cool. And um, so I told my dad, because I knew if I told my mom, she'd get upset. Um, I told my dad to take me to this, this Catholic church to meet with the parish uh, pastor. And he was like, okay. So I went to the parish. I talked with the priest for about an hour. I asked him some pretty ignorant questions in hindsight. I remember one of the ones I asked, I was like, what do you do as a priest all day? Do you get to read the Bible? And he laughed for a solid minute before he said, I wish, I wish all I got to do was read the Bible. Um, and, and, <laughs> and, and, um, and uh, I, I told him, I was like, well, I think I'd like to make moves towards converting. And he was like, well, He's like, well, you're 15, you're really young. He's like, you know, let's give it some time and see if you're still interested in a couple months and we can come back and revisit this. And I was like, okay. Well, in the meantime, my parents had been saving money away, and this is something they did for all three of us, was they were saving money away for each of us to have one big trip somewhere else in the world before we became an adult. And for me, that happened to be Italy. So I got sent to Italy three months later on a nine-month trip with my school friends to, um, to visit. We, went to, we landed in Milan, went to Verona, then we spent a day in Venice, went down to uh, Florence, then went to Pisa, back to Florence, then to Assisi, down to Rome, Naples, and then back to Rome, and then we left. And on that trip, I mean, it's really impossible to go to Italy without just being you're kind of like forcefully submerged in all the Catholicism down there. It's like half the tourist sites are churches. So you're walking in and out of Catholic churches and you're just, uh, even as a Protestant, I was, I mean, you're kind of like in awe of just the grandiosity of these big buildings with crucifixes and with um, frescoes and mosaics. And um, I, mean, I was particular, I don't have a photo of it because I don't know why, but I was particularly impressed by San Marco in Venice with the frescoes. On, I mean, the, the big, these beautiful mosaics all over the place, you have, like these multi-tier domes. It's in the Byzantine style, so um, it's, it's like a Greco-Italian fusion. It's, it's a really cool place to visit. But here um, on the right there is the, the Duomo di Firenze. Um, that's the Cathedral of Florence. We got to climb all the way to the top. This is the view from the bell tower, but you can also climb. You see where the steeple is right there, those big... Uh, windows at the top, those are actually doors, and you can cl climb out and you see the whole city from the top of the church. It's 
breathtaking. Um, so that's a gondola ride in Venice. Um, that was me and my friend Claire um, at the top of that church. So that's the view from the city. Um, and then the one on the right are the Vatican museums. So um, this was hugely impactful on me. And by the end of this trip, I had decided, I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to become Catholic. So I went back to my parish. I went back to the priest uh, right around Easter time. And I said, Father Norbert, that's, he's still pastor there too, Father Norbert, um, I'd like to become Catholic. He's like, okay, well, we'll put you in the confirmation program with the other Catholic kids. Cause I was only 15, so I was the same age as them, so they were kind of put me in RCIA. So um, I was put in the, the confirmation program with the other Catholic kids, and uh, that began the next um, August. However, um, I, it was not an easy road for me. Um, early on into my faith, uh, I began to get more and more uh, I would say online with my, with my Catholicism. And Catholicism on the internet has a couple very distinct groups, and one of those is radical traditionalism. And I became, I think as a reaction to my Protestant upbringing and my specifically very low church, low liturgy, low emphasis on any type of tradition Protestantism, I became very enraptured with um, what would be called, I guess, hyper-traditionalist Catholicism. So the, the symbol on the right is the symbol of the Society of St. Pius X, which is a schismatic religious congregation that only says the traditional Latin Mass. And the symbol on the right is the symbol of... Um, I mean, really, it's a symbol for the Holy See, but it's used by what's called Seda Vacantists, who are a group of schismatic, or I'm really almost pseudo-Protestant Catholics that believe that ever since Paul VI died, or no, ever since Pius XII died, there has never been another valid pope, and that all the other ones are heretics who have been holding the office in, um, uh, unofficially. And I became really intrigued with these ideas. I flirted with... Uh, state of Vacantism for a while, I would have called myself a subscriber to the theology of the Society of St. Pius X till about, I was the age of 17, so a good year and a half. Um, even though I was going to a normal Catholic parish, um, I got really invested in this theology, and I really, I bought a lot of what they were saying hook, line, and sinker. It actually took another priest who was on the internet who, um, I, I asked him a question um, at one point on a social media service, and he gave me like a butt whooping and it really caused me to to rethink my positions and I gradually mellowed out but um, I would I would caution anybody who's who love I mean, a lot of people get into this stuff with genuine intentions and with a great love of the church but it very quickly subverts itself into I mean I look back on this and I see how arrogant I was and thinking that I knew better you know and and that was kind of what it ends up coming down to so um, a lot of people get into this theology for good reasons but it becomes something very perverted and wrong and I'm, I'm glad that the Lord brought me out of it but uh, this is another important step on my journey and I'm, I'm I, I felt compelled to share it because I think it's important that people know that um, I think a lot of converts get tempted to this I know a lot of friends who also converted who fell into this or might still be falling into it. Um, it's, it's, it's a big group of converts get stuck in this mire of pseudo-traditionalist um, thought. But I made my way out and I thank God every day that I did. But finally, after all of that, I did come home. I was confirmed two years after I first approached the Catholic parish. Um, on the left is my first catechist, um, Marlon Barrow, who is now a He'll be a deacon in a couple, I mean, in one year. He's in the seminary now, too. So he'll be a deacon in a year, which is really kind of funny. I, he entered seminary two years after I did, but because he already had a college degree, he's already ahead of me. But um, it was really funny. I remember the first time I heard he was a seminarian, we, 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 we texted each other. He was like, I can't believe it. We're both, you know, it was, it was really funny. But um, he's really great. Um, this, this photo in the center is my confirmation day. Uh, you can see my sister doesn't look too amused in that picture. But... Um, <laughs> I think, I think my parents had to drag her there. Um, I don't know where my mom is either. I think she's in this picture. She might just be cropped out because PowerPoint did that. But um, my grandparents are there. My, my Mimi, her name is Betty. And then my dad, dad, his name was Don. He passed away in 2022. But, um, and then my little brother, of course, is over there. Um, and then that was my technically my godparent, but my confirmation sponsor, um, Steve. He was um, an echo apprentice from Notre Dame College. Uh, who was serving at my parish for two years. And um, he was also a convert, and we bonded over that. And he also, I would credit him with getting me out of all the traditionalist bunkum 
that I got stuck in. Um, he really helped me with that, um, coming back to a more orthodox and, um, what's the word? Uh, yeah, Catholic theology, thank you. Um, <laughs> but, um, but this is a very happy day. Um, I, I remember it really well. And I, I also remember, too, my, my hardcore Presbyterian great-grandparents on my father's side um, sent me a card when I was confirmed, and that meant a lot to me because I thought they wouldn't have been happy. At this point, my mother was becoming less and less opposed to it. She was very much affected by the sex abuse scandals in the early 2000s, which is why she never wanted us to go to Catholic school. And um, when I first started converting, she made me promise her that I wouldn't become an altar server um, <laughs> because she was really, she was seriously worried that I would be abused. Um, I mean, she, she was terrified. Uh, that was, it took a long time for her to become accustomed to this. And I, I think she's let go of almost all her prejudice. She's very, she loves coming to visit the seminary now and she's very much, um, I think she's over it. And I, I think part of that just had to do with you know, exposure over time, you know, the more you grow to love people who love a thing, you stop hating that thing, that those people that you love love, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, but over time, she's, she's come to really support me and my decision. But um, this is when that finally, I think that, that iceberg started to thaw. So following my conversion, I began to discern religious life more seriously. I, the idea had been in my head since I first started becoming Catholic. A lot of the inspiration to initially convert came from what I would consider like the physical beauty and awe of the sacramental theology, um, but also the structures, the vestments, the music, the um, just the whole Catholic shtick that, you know. Um, so, uh, one of those things was the priesthood, you know, the vest. I, I mean, it was like really cool. It was like, you know, like they're not just they're not just guys that we elected from our parish body. Like, no, these are holy men who were instituted by God. You know, they have their, yeah, yeah. Their bishop puts his hands on them and they become, you know, like, like as opposed to, I mean, and, 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 and like in our parishes, or Lutheran, I keep saying parish, they would never call their church a parish. But in Lutheran churches, it's an elected member of the body who usually has a theology degree and usually some sort of approval from the local body. But um, for me, at least when I first converted the, the legitimacy of the Catholic priesthood felt much more substantiated because of the whole tradition of apostolic succession, laying on of hands, and the sacramental theology, as opposed to it being like, oh, this is pastor so-and-so, he was elected by the parish council, and it's like, now he's your pastor, and it's like, oh, okay. Um, so um, I was attracted to the idea of the priesthood, but this is when I first really began to discern it. So um, these pictures here are all from various scenes of my, my first year as a Catholic. Uh, the first one is the reconsecration of our parish after Hurricane Harvey. Um, my parish was completely flooded. We had six feet of water in the, the church after Harvey. And so we, were, we did mass in a tent, which is actually where that bottom picture is from. That was our Feast of Guadalupe um, in a big tent that we had in the front yard. Um, that was our parish for nine months. And uh, that was, but that's Deacon Scott, one of the seven permanent deacons that are stationed at my parish. Um, uh, as he and I were incensing the church as we, um, there were, three deacons that had to incense the church. We went like up and down all the pews as part of the, the rite of consecration. Um, bottom right is now, he was deacon, but now Father Ricardo Areola. He is a priest in the diocese, of, or Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. Um, he was positioned at our seminary for his pastoral year, or at our parish for his pastoral year. And he and I became good friends during that time and he helped inspire me to go to the seminary. Um, he had a lot of effect on that. And, um, he and I are still, we still talk today. I visit his parish when I can, when I'm home. He's a, he's a good priest and um, he has some really, he's an, he's an immigrant from Mexico too, so he has some really cool stories about that as well. Um, and then the top photo right there, my parochial vicar for the time, uh, for a time, about three years, was Father Coy He was a, um, uh, he was our priest and he's also a Benedictine oblate at this, uh, this is the Monastery of Christ in the Desert in New Mexico. It's one of the most remote monasteries in the United States and it had a big impact on his entering the priesthood, and so he actually invited me to come to this monastery to help discern my vocation to the priesthood with him. He was holding a big retreat there. So um, I asked my father if I could go, and he said yes, and um, I got to go to this monastery for a whole week. And 
this was that was a really great experience. It's, it's an incredible place. You're two hours from any civilization. The monastery is entirely self-sustaining. They run their own electricity off of solar panels. They draw their water from the local river. The only thing they bring in are their dairy and meat products, and the rest is all locally grown. So like they grow their own herbs, their own spices for the most part. Um, they only have like one computer in the monastery. Uh, besides the one that they use for their gift shop, they also make and sell things in their gift shop, which they will ship. Um, and they have beer. They make hops for beer and they sell that at the local gas station, which for local for them is two and a half hours away. But um, uh, it's worth a visit if ever you find yourself in New Mexico or want a really in-depth retreat. It really helped me to discern my vocation and the natural beauty is just immaculate. You're surrounded on all sides by these canyons with this greenery all over it. There's sometimes in the winter time you'll see snow because it's the desert, so it'll snow there too. And the most awe striking thing of all is because it's so far out from all the cities, there's no light pollution. So you can lay on your back in the yard and you can just see comets and all the stars. I mean, it's incredible. If you ever get to go, um, if you ever want to discern priesthood or religious life yourself, I highly recommend Christ in the Desert Monastery. <laughs> However, that, those weren't the only things that, that inspired me to start discerning. A big factor was Eucharistic adoration. And this is also part of what brought me to Sacred Heart, um, the Sacred Heart community, because religion, or Eucharistic adoration is a big part of our daily devotion. Um, at the house here in Mississippi, we have adoration every day, except for every weekday, except for Friday. And then in the seminary, we have adoration every weekday. Uh, <laughs> or pardon me, every day except Thursday. Thank you, Father. Um, and um, part of my initial formation was um, our, our, our um, confirmation program sends kids to what's called uh, Steubenville conferences. They have one in Dallas called Steubenville Lone Star, but they're all put on by the TOR Franciscans, the Third Order Regulars, um, who run Steubenville College in, in Ohio, I think. And so they, they have these big conferences. Usually it's something like in the ballpark of like 5,000 kids or more all come down to these um, uh, these conference halls, usually in hotels, and um, there's presentations on relevant issues of faith and morals for young people, like how do I stay Catholic in the age of the internet? You know, how do I deal with things like, I mean, I guess it's kind of crass, but like pornography is a big problem, um, stuff like that. I mean, they have talks on um, how, to, how to stay friends with your, how to be Catholic and friends with your gay friends at the same time. So like stuff that relevant issues that young Catholics will encounter in high school for the most part. These are, this is mostly geared towards high schoolers. Um, but one of the biggest things they do, and this is actually a picture from one of them, is um, Eucharistic adoration processions through the hall. So you'll have these big halls full of all these chairs and all of us are sitting there. Usually you're wearing shirts from your parish, so every parish has like a special shirt that they're wearing. I remember ours one year was like this big bright blue shirt with like a, a picture of St. Ignatius on it. Um, but um, everyone will be sitting there and they'll be playing music up on the stage and then the priest will come down with the monstrous and he processes around you. They'll have incense, um, candles, the whole nine yards. and. Um, one of the things that I was most reluctant to accept when I first converted was the true presence. I think that was probably the last doctrine of the Catholic Church that I really came to affirm. Um, I got over Mary, I got over veneration of the I, got, I came to all that before true, I think that was probably the last thing I finally bought. And it was actually at one of these conferences um, that I had, this is, I went to two, one before and one after I officially entered the church. And the one after I entered the church uh, they were they were doing the procession, and I remember just looking at the monstrous and thinking, like, you know, Jesus, if you're really there, I need to know. And when the monstrous passed me by during that procession, I was hit with an immense feeling of just complete ineptitude, and I collapsed to the floor in tears for probably about five minutes. Um, I was just on the ground crying, and when I finally picked myself back up and looked at the host again. Instead of that feeling of ineptitude, I was filled with this desire to hold it. I wanted to touch and hold the monstrous. And I felt that was an affirmation of my desire to become a religious of some sort, or a priest at least. Um, so adoration had a really big impact on my, my desire to become a Catholic priest. Um, however, that's not the only thing. Um, I, I'm an avid spiritual reader. 
I, I'm not quite as avid as Father David. I think he reads like 20 times as many books as I do, but, but I, I do love to read. And another thing that I got really interested in was the books of an author named Shusaku Endo. He is, or was, he, he died in the 90s, but he was a Japanese Catholic author who was born in South Korea during the Japanese occupation of the peninsula. His mother was Catholic, I don't think his father was, and he was uh, baptized at the age of 12, I believe. And he stayed true to Catholicism all his life, but he constantly felt conflict between his Japanese culture and his Catholic identity. And he, writes, he wrote a ton of books on this, um, and I got really into his work, so um, I began devouring his novels. Silence I read when I was 16 before I became Catholic, and then the rest I all read afterwards. Um, Silence is also a movie, by the way, if you, wanna, if you, if you can't stomach the book. Uh, it, both the book and the movie are hard to read or watch. They're, they both deal with very vivid depictions of Christian persecution. But uh, the film is by Martin Scorsese. It was released in 2016, if you want to see it. Um, it's an excellent film. But the book, um, these books all have to do, by and large, with the history of Christianity in Japan, the suffering, the martyrdom, and the anguish that the community went through. Um, however, out of all of these, the one that was most impactful is the one on the far right, Kiku's Prayer, which has to do with the last bout of Japanese Catholic persecution that happened in the 1800s following the reopening of the country to the West. So when the country finally reopened, a lot of mission, because for a long time they had known that Catholicism had flourished in Japan for about 45 years after St. Francis Xavier first went there. Um, it was actually one of the fastest growing religions in the country. Um, almost the entire island of Kyushu, which is like the southernmost one, was Catholic. Um, vast swaths of Japanese people had converted, and these were very authentic conversions. And so when they, they had heard that the Japanese government had basically wiped it all out under the shogunate, a lot of French missionaries, including one Bernard Petitjean, who's the priest right there in the chair, went to Japan with the intent of finding out what happened to these people. Were they all eliminated? Did they all convert? Are there, is there any history of them? And so for the last 220 years, the shogunate had forced all the people that had formerly been Catholic to step on an image of Jesus once a year for their, um, whether they had apostatized or not, they had to continue to do it to affirm that they were no longer Catholic. And their, their ancestors had, or their descendants had to do it too. Um, and so there was one village particularly big one that had all remained Catholic but still continued to participate in this ritual. It was called the Fumie in Japanese. It li literally means to step on. Um, but uh, it was called Urakami Village. And while he was in Japan, he was sent to Nagasaki, which was the capital of Japanese Catholicism. And while he was serving there, he built a church and he would catch people come past the church and they would make very small signs of the cross. And he was like, I think they might still exist. And so he found them again, and uh, what, he, what he began to do is he would, he, would, he would walk out, he'd make sure he'd get his cassock all nice and clean, and he'd put his collar on, and he'd walk through the city every day until they would introduce themselves to him. And Indo talks about this all in Kiku's prayer, and I became very fascinated with the life of a missionary, um, like the, and the work that he put into bringing the gospel back to this country. And... Slowly but surely, he was, they, they, these people were terrified because they knew the moment they came out of hiding, they would be persecuted again. But they slowly approached him, began to receive the sacrament. This is the first time these people had received any sacrament from a priest in 220 years. They had, the only thing that had kept them alive was they had old Portuguese books that they had preserved for that long, and then they had carved images that looked like Buddhas into Jesus and Mary, and that was like all they had. Um, they had one member of the community that would baptize, usually the senior um, male would baptize babies, and that was it. Um, that's the only sacrament they would have. They had no confession. They had no way to receive the Eucharist, nothing. And this was the first time any priest had shown up there. And his story and the way that Indo tells this in Kiku's Prayer, there's a lot more in that book that I love. Um, he also grapples with the problem of pain, the problem of evil, suffering. Why does it happen? Why did it happen to these people? Um, it's a fantastic book. But um, that missionary impetus was part of what actually convinced me not to be a diocesan priest, because I had been discerning, do I want to enter the Diocese of Galveston, Houston? I decided not to because of this book. Now, another important thing that played a factor both in my conversion and in my, my vocation story is music. Um, all of you, I think, for the most part know that I sing. Um, I am a classically trained tenor. I've, I've studied under an operatic tenor for in my novitiate year. Um, I did five years of musical theater in middle school. 
where I got my initial vocal training. So I am a vocalist. Um, and, but I, I actually didn't really get into sacred music until I was 17 years old, and I first heard a piece by Johann Sebastian Bach called his Matthias Passion, or the St. Matthew Passion. And that book completely shattered my understanding of what music was and what it could do. Up until that point, the most I had sang was musical theater. I'd been in and out of plays. I'd done like Susical the Musical. I'd done The Little Mermaid. Stuff, you know, fun stuff like that. But this changed my understanding of what music is. Um, and him alongside, uh, I, I selected four composers that are significant. There are many others that I love. But uh, that's J.S. Bach. Felix Mendelssohn. Bach was a Lutheran, by the way. Um, so that's the one vestige, that's the last vestige of Lutheranism I cling to. Felix Mendelssohn, who was a Calvinist. William Byrd, who was an English Catholic. And um, this is a modern composer, Kim Andre Arneson. He's from Norway, and he composed a sacred music, mostly in the Lutheran tradition, but he also has composed some stuff for Catholic churches as well. Um, he actually has one particular piece, if you're looking for, um, called... Uh, the Holy Spirit Mass, which he wrote for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, which he wrote as a healing work between the Lutheran and Catholic churches, which I find particularly compelling given my conversion history. So, so that was that was my choir. <laughs> um, <laughs> but. Um, Music continues to be and is uh, a core aspect of my prayer life and my understanding of God. And before and after my conversion, my journey into religious life, I still rely on music as, um, for me, the most important method of prayer. That, there's an apocryphal saying by St. Augustine that when you sing, you pray twice. He didn't actually say that, but um, I do believe it, even though he didn't say it. Um, but there is something he did say, which is um, cantare amantis est, and that is to sing is to love. So. Um, and that I do believe, uh, especially when you're dealing with music like this. And I can't promise you that every uh, seminarian sings. Um, I know a lot of our guys don't. But for me, this is instrumental to my identity as a Catholic and as a religious. And so I, I wanted to share that with you all. And I also know you all wanted to hear me sing. So kills two birds with one stone. So. <laughs> Um, finally, I wanted to share my, my life as a SCJ. Um, these are some scenes from my various ministries and times in formation. Up on the left was my institution of lector earlier this year with um, Father Fianar Provincial and my spiritual director, Father John Chizinski, who um, I cannot credit enough for helping me become the religious that I am right now. And hopefully he will continue to help me become a better one. Uh, I know I have a lot of ways to grow, so, but John Chazinski is an incredible, uh, he was our former provincial for, I want to say six, six years. He, um, incredible man, he's, he worked his form in formation for most of his priesthood, and now he's retired, but he does spiritual direction. Um, Father Vian, of course, as I said, is our provincial. You might have, I don't know if, how many of you have met him, I know some of you have, but um, he comes down somewhat regularly to visit our ministries and sites. and. Um, He's continually present in our lives in formation as well and is an important aspect of um, our congregation and helps encourage us to be better SCJs every day. Um, the right, top, top right is my, my first vows. That was me kneeling to make my first vows um, on the 15th of August, 2022. So um, probably one of the most important days of my life. And um, I, I always try to think back to it. I want it, I also, I always believe in show and tell, so I brought my, even though I'm not wearing it, I brought my first profession cross, so I wanted to, yeah. Um, this is put around our necks after we swear our vows, so very important. Uh, bottom left um, is my postulancy ceremony with Jonathan and Michael and Andre Sudol, our, um, who was our assistant novice director and now is pastor of St. Martin of Tours Parish in Milwaukee. Pardon me. And then Father Ed Kilianski our late provincial, um, another very inspirational figure to me. Um, um, I'm not sure if you ever met him, but he, he passed away um, soon after his term ended, but um, very good man and an inspiration to me and many of us in formation. Um, and then the final picture there is um, a photograph from a ministry I did. This is an altar server training camp that I hosted at Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, I was teaching the kids how to use the thurible. Um, that was probably something they loved I, the most I remember from that camp they they it's always fun to swing a big ball of fire around so <laughs> um, but um, I mean it's just four little snippets of a whole six years of my life and um, 
I mean, it's really hard to encapsulate just how important being a Dehonian is to me. I think because of the stage at which I was introduced to the Sacred Heart Fathers, the age at which I came into, I was 18, you know, I'd only been a Catholic for a year, actually really a little less, no, no a little more than a year. And so a big part of my identity as a Catholic is wrapped up in the Dehonian charism and our understanding of, of, of Christianity. And um, when we say we are sons of Dehon, um, I think we say that very seriously. I, I am a Catholic and I am a Dehonian, and those two statements are not, I mean, those two statements are joined at the hip. Um, I, am, I am a Dehonian because I'm Catholic. I am a Catholic because I'm a Dehonian. And our charism, our spirituality, uh, love and reparation, um, well, really love and a spirit of, a re uh, what a, goodness, Father Byron has a very poetic way of putting it. He's our novice master, so he taught me a lot of what I know about our spirituality, but, um, um, Oblation in a spirit of love and reparation. That's it. That's how he always likes to sum up our, our, our spirituality. Um, and he also, um, for those of you who are associates, um, Constitutions 23 is always what he would say is our most important, um, our most important um, statement of faith as SCJs, um, that we are moved by the spirit at all times to return love to God. Um, that, and that our vocation is at its core. And Father John always tells me this, returning love for love. That who we are, we are loved by God, and because we are loved by God, we are not only given our vocation as SCJs, but our impetus to mission. And so it is because I know I am a loved son of God, a loved son of Father Dehon, that I can go forward and I can serve you all in the ways in which I am able to. Um, so I think, I mean, if I was to sum all this up, this is my story. It's not everyone's story. Everyone has a different story. I, I've met many priests who have had radically different reasons for becoming priests, or many seminarians who have radically different reasons for entering the seminary. Um, no two vocation stories are the same, but everyone deserves to be told, um, whether it's to the married life, whether it's to the priesthood, whether it's to the permanent diaconate, whether it's to diocesan hermitage. Um, every, every vocation deserves to be heard. And we get that far because we try um, as best we can to be attentive to the Spirit, to be willing to listen to God, and to have a heart open to His love so that we can make a return of it. So, thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, Father Jacob is willing to answer questions. He will repeat your question. That's because he has two mics on. One goes directly to Sister Rosa's camera, and so that way the people who watch later online can hear what the question was that he's answering. Um, what is a Dehonian? I don't know what that is. Um, so the question is, no, no, no. The question is, what is a Dehonian? Um, so all of us here at, uh, who work the six parishes of northern Mississippi, we are all members of the Priest of the Sacred Heart or the Dehonians is a, an alternative name for us because we were founded by a priest named Father Leo John Dehon. And we, sort of like how um, you call the, the Dominicans are an order of priests founded by St. Dominic, their real name is the Order of Preachers, but they're affectionately called the Dominicans. Same like our name is the Priest of the Sacred Heart, we're affectionately known as Dehonians. So all of us belong to that priestly order, we're bound by the same charism, we're bound by the same mission, and so we're, an yeah, it's an alternative name for Priest of the Sacred Heart, yes. Thank you. Are you in Milwaukee now, and how many years do you anticipate before ordination? I am in Milwaukee. So the question is, am I in Milwaukee now, and how many years till I'm ordained? Uh, the answer is, yes, I am technically stationed in Milwaukee now. I won't be for the next month because I'm going on vacation, but um, <laughs> as of August, I'll be back in Milwaukee, and I'll be there in de oh, until I finish my, um, my next year of theology. But um, I anticipate another four years to ordination. Um, I have three more, three more years of theology, including this coming one, and then a year of pastoral ministry. Okay. So, Thank you. You're welcome.
You said that you took vows two years ago, yes. I believe. Do you renew those vows every year? Is there some point at which they become perpetual vows or permanent vows? So the question is, I made vows two years ago. Do I have to renew those yearly? And if I do, when do they become perpetual? So the answer is, I did take vows two years ago. And yes, I do renew them every year. Um, that happens for a minimum of four years. I renew my yearly vows. And after that, I can make a request to the, superior, uh, the provincial superior and say, I'd like to make my final vows. And those are perpetual. And if the council and the provincial both say yes, then I get put into what's called a final vow program. And I'm put under a priest of the community or a brother who has been in the community, usually about, what is it? Like, I think it's a minimum of 10 years. Um, and they will school me in the spirituality another time for usually about six months. And then uh, you get put into a, um, you get to plan a liturgy and then you make your final vows. And um, after that, you usually, it's usually done close to your diaconate ordination, so usually like a six months before. So, but yes, that, that's generally how it works. Okay, that's no, not a bad reason. <laughs> My question is, when you got involved in the two social groups, mm -hmm. okay, what was ultimately what kind of swayed you away from all of that? Like, I know you had mm -hmm. lots of influence, you had a lot of people. Yeah. What ultimately was that change? So the question is, when I got involved in the radical traditionalist aspects of Catholicism, what was it that brought me out of it? Um, I stated during the talk a big, a big thing was um, this priest I met online who, um, I, it really did have a big impact on, I think being publicly humiliated has a big pack, impact on anybody. <laughs> um, it really, really caused me to rethink my positions. Um, I think I came to realize just how arrogant I was. Um, specifically. Specifically. More, more, I mean, more in more detail. More, more detail. detail. Um, I came to realize that the positions were born out of a place of thinking that I knew more, more than the institutional theologians, I think. Um, and it comes out of that for a lot of people. And you become, Christ says you'll know them by your, their fruits, by and large. Um, most people I've met who are interested in this type of Catholicism come from an authentic place of worry or fear or perhaps genuine love, but it curdles into this, I don't want to use the word bigoted because that sounds wrong, but it becomes this sort of, I'm better than you because I go to this type of mass and you don't. I, I, I know better than you and you're, you're bad and you're wrong and you're all going to hell. And I'm, it becomes this purity spiraling sort of exclusivist culture where, um, I don't know, I just, it, it became almost toxic to me. Versus like, being just preferred. What do you mean? Like Versus a, like being preferred. If you're talking about like the Latin mass. Oh, sure, sure. Like, but these yeah. aren't just Latin mass groups. Well, like no, these, these were schismatic. I mean, yeah, right. yeah. Um, like, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, obviously, yeah. Um, I, I, I have been to three Latin masses, and I've enjoyed all three of them. Sure. It's not my cup of tea, but um, actually, Father Ricardo Ariola, who I had up there, he says a Latin mass every, week, every month. Sure. Um, and he and I are very good friends. Um, I, hold, I, think, I think if a Catholic has a preference for that type of liturgy, more power to you. Sure. Um, but um, the issue is when it becomes like a Society of St. Pius X thing where you're like, well, I'm no longer going to respect the authority of the church and I think I know better, you know, and... Um, More divisive. Yeah, when you, well, it becomes divisive, it becomes... Um, I mean, one, you're, you're breaking the magisterium, you're no longer respecting the law of the church, and um, if it curdles into state of acantism where you just flat out say, I don't believe the Pope is the Pope, then you've really got a problem. That's like Archbishop Vigano who just recently got excommunicated, so... Um, it's important, I, I think it's important to have these things in the church. Um, I, for one, love traditional aesthetics. I'm, I'm, I'm totally fine with the Latin. I think most people my age in the seminary are, um, at varying degrees, but um, um, yeah, I, I, would, I would just always be cautious of that becoming a temptation to think, I know better than the church and therefore uh, the Pope is like wrong or whatever, which is where it became for me before I was kind of snapped back into reality. Thank you. You're welcome.